Professor Waro, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks. It's nice to talk to you today. Why don't we start with your background? Where'd you start off? How'd you get interested in this area, uh, the arc of your career so far, and where you are now? Well, I grew up in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. I went to uh, Penn State for my undergraduate education. And from there, I went to graduate school at Cornell. Um, I was on the law school track as an undergrad, and I had uh, very engaged and, and insightful advisors who said that I should think about academia as a career. And uh, that was, you know, best advice I ever got. Um, I ended up at Cornell to do PhD there. I had uh, also a set of awesome advisors and um, they put me on a path. Um, it's kind of unusual for a Cornell student given the reputation of the department at the time, but it, it all worked out very well for me. Um, and I got a job at Columbia University out of graduate school. Uh, it was my first job. It's in all likelihood going to be my last job. Um, and so, uh, you know, I, I've been shaped by many, many important mentors over the years. And um, a lot of the projects I worked on, you know, this I'm still working on, the seeds were planted in graduate school. So, you know, you have good advisors when they can uh, help foster your interests and put you on, on, a, on a path that will sustain you for, for many, many years. So, you know, in, in terms of the graduate work and then after that, you know, what are the sort of the broad themes of, that capture your interest, you know, rather than the specific areas? What motivated you to move into the political science area and what is the, the general theme of your work? I said, you know, I was on the on the on the law track. I actually was uh, I, I, I was thinking about doing a pre-law major um, as an undergraduate and I was steered away from that. Like another excellent piece of advice that I received. Uh, and told that I could do a political science major and basically take the same exact classes that I would as a, as a pre-law major. And uh, thankfully, I took that advice because I decided I did not want to go to law school and pursue a legal career. Um, so that led me to do political science. And I was, um, I was in college in the 80s, uh, which is a very interesting historical moment. Um, this was you know, the fall of communism um, in, in Eastern Europe and Soviet Union. Um, and so I, I got interested in questions about institutions, questions about history, how we got to where we were at that point, um, questions about democratization, democratic institutions, um, why, how do you design them, what, uh, how do you design them to be effective, um, what makes certain countries democracies and other countries not democracies. Um, so I always had this interest in history, even though mainly from a, from a political angle. Um, and then when I got to graduate school, um, I got really interested in Congress um, because it seemed to me like Congress was really the key to understanding democracy in the United States um, and legislatures generally uh, as important to understanding democracy anywhere in the world. Um, I One of my advisors was an economic historian, and he turned me on to some incredibly interesting work done by economists who um, were using data in ways that I never thought possible. So the ability, you know, basically going back, um, going into archives and compiling extremely complicated, detailed data sets from uh, periods long ago. Um, I got interested in quantitative methods because the kinds of questions that I was interested in, interested in answering seem to be most amenable to quantitative analysis, um, but always with a, with a strong element of, of, of paying attention to history. Um, and so uh, I, at some point, I decided I was interested in legislative entrepreneurship, uh, probably the, you know, the, uh, the economics influence showed up there as well, the idea of what entrepreneurship is in, 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 uh, in, in an economy and um, how economists thought about the concept of entrepreneurship, what it meant for uh, concepts of like equilibria and, and, and things like that. Do entrepreneurs upset equilibria or do they find um, uh, areas where, where things are not in equilibrium? And so there's, there are opportunities for them to exploit. And so I, I found that some of the, some of the conceptualizations for, for entrepreneurship and economics actually could be ported to the political world. Um, and so the idea that members of Congress are entrepreneurs in certain ways, um, what I got interested in was why they would seek to become 
legislative entrepreneurs. Um, so I think at the time there was a there was a book by John Kingdon that had come out not, not too far, uh, not too many years before this, on on policy entrepreneurship. But it wasn't really that focused on Congress, and there wasn't really wasn't much formal theoretical development there, and certainly not much in the way of systematic quantitative analysis. Um, and so that's what I sought to bring to my first major project as a, as a graduate student. Um, it evolved into a dissertation. Um, I developed a theory of legislative entrepreneurship. Um, and uh, at the heart of the, of the project was a puzzle um, where if you study Congress, one of the things that you learn is that most people know very little about Congress. Um, your average constituent, your average voter, you're lucky if they can they can name who their representative is, let alone what the representative does. Uh, maybe they know how they cast a roll call vote here or there. Um, but we know that members of Congress take very seriously their jobs, and um, some of them work very hard at their jobs, to, uh, especially toiling behind the scenes in order to make legislation happen. Um, there is... Um, I know there, 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 there are workhorses, there are show horses in Congress, right? The old classic Congress literature talks about workhorses and show horses. What I really want to understand is um, why the workhorses did what they did when um, the electoral incentives to do so seem to be minimal. Um, and so the, the way the project evolved was um, thinking about ways that members could be incentivized to use through the institution um, in order to uh, tap into their desire to be workhorses. Well, I'm sure there are members of, you know, members of Congress are extremely ambitious to, you know, to get to Congress. You have to be extremely hardworking, very ambitious. Um, and, you know, how, but not everybody put in the kinds of work that some members of Congress did to pass major legislation or even minor legislation. Um, they would introduce legislation, but a lot, you know, that's trivial. Um, what, how do they take it to the next level in terms of actually shepherding it through the complicated, convoluted process to have a finished product that is, is a law? Um, and so, uh, you know, I adopted an institutionalist perspective, may, mainly figuring out that what seemed to be explaining variation in legislative entrepreneurship um, in terms of incentives had to do with uh, institutional ambition. And so the institution, you know, Congress is an incredibly hierarchical institution, right? There are, you have your rank and file members, um, but then there are all these institutional features that enable members of Congress to realize their ambitions, right? So at the very top, you have party leaders, um, speaker of the house, um, majority leader, et cetera. Um, and then you have the committee structure. So you have committees, subcommittees, you have committee chairs. Um, and so the, um, it seemed to me that there were, there was an idea of progressive ambition that could help us understand why members of Congress engaged in this behavior where there didn't seem to be much electoral return for it. And so um, I did look at whether or not there was electoral uh, return and, and use some quantitative methods to see what, if a member engaged in legislative entrepreneurship, were they uh, more likely to win re-election? Um, so that requires coming up with a measure of legislative entrepreneurship, um, which um, one of my advisors, Walter Mevin at the time, um, helped me basically scrape the entire Library of Congress database uh, for legislation, for legislative action. Um, this was uh, something that was used by members of Congress and their staff to figure out what's what's been introduced, what's where is it in the legislative process, um, and so uh, we we wrote code that that uh, essentially downloaded all that information, um, which at the time was it was a it was a massive data set, um, and it actually was too big to put on most hard disks that were available at that time, and sadly that that data has been lost because I. You know, I couldn't, it was so big, I could not create sufficient backups for it. Um, so the, the system no longer exists. It's been replaced by others, but there is a lot of data there that unfortunately we don't have access to anymore. Um, so we used that uh, information that was in that database to come up with 
um, a measure of legislative entrepreneurship, which tapped into things like how many co-sponsors were attracted to legislation, um, how complicated was, was the legislation. Um, so we came up with a number um, that described in a given Congress the entrepreneurship score for, uh, for a member. Um, and so we looked, we see, did that score correlate with election outcomes? It didn't. Um, did that score correlate with campaign finance? You might think that maybe they're doing this because they want to get campaign donations from those who are interested in the legislation would benefit from the legislation. Didn't seem to be much of a correlation there either. Um, but where, where there was correlation was between that's the, the scores and the probability that they would rise through the institution. Um, so would they transfer, would they be able to transfer to a more exclusive committee? Yes, they, 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 they did. Would they rise to party leadership positions? Yes, they, they, they would. So there were these kinds of correlations there that I thought confirmed this, this hypothesis about the institutional structure of Congress providing the incentives um, for this. And it, you know, it's, it's basically win-win. So Congress would not be a, a, an important democratic institution if it couldn't carry out its fundamental duties of legislating. Uh, and it can't do that unless its members actually step up, put in the hard work to make things happen. Um, but, and, and if they are rewarded with advancement through the institution, they get put into positions where they acquire more resources that, guess what, they get to do with those resources, they can further enhance the legislative productivity of Congress. Um, and so that was, you know, that, that, that's, the, that's the broad outlines of the project. Um, the one area that I uh, didn't get to explore in the, in the project that I wish I had was more of, more of an historical perspective. So the, the data at that time basically covered, it was 1970, I think 1973 up to um, 1993. Um, so a, a nice chunk of history, right? 30 years, but, um, or 20 years, but, uh, but it didn't really cover a lot of con congressional history in terms of the evolution of the institution. So the seventies were an important area of reform. Um, many of the institutional positions and, and institutional structures that could provide these incentives were created or modified significantly in the 1970s. Uh, but you could look back further, even like the, you know, the creation of the committee system and how did that create new incentives? The, the, um, you know, the development of the importance of party leadership positions, the expansion of party leadership positions. So there really wasn't that, that, that much of an historical dimension to the project. Um, and that's, that's the one thing that I wish I had done with the project, but, but after finishing the dissertation, getting a job and, and publishing it as a book, I decided to move on to other things. Um, the other major project that uh, the seeds were planted in graduate school was uh, eventually became my second book project, which is about the filibuster. Um, this, this book is primarily historical. Uh, it's an historical analysis of the, the filibuster, the evolution of the filibuster, its use over time, trying to understand through the, uh, how, we, how we need to have a different perspective on the the use of the filibuster that as a perspective that differs from how the, the Senate currently works, because the um, you, it's often pointed out that the Senate had no provision for ending debate between 1806 and 1917. So how did the Senate get anything done? Right. If, um, if basically you have uh, what some claim was a unanimity rule for ending debate and, and moving on legislative business, um, how could the Senate function? Um, and so, uh, that, but that, that question is largely posed through the lens of the, of the current Senate, um, which is a super majoritarian institution. We have a cloture rule that requires 60 senators to end a filibuster, uh, to end debate and, and uh, progress to, a, uh, to final passage votes. Um, and given how senators have exploited the supermajoritarian provisions of the Senate in today's world, um, how could the Senate possibly have functioned as an institution? Now, there were many who believed, especially at the end of the 19th century, that the Senate was not a functioning institution because 
there was a filibuster in a given Senate, right? Whereas today, you know, everything pretty much gets filibustered. Um, so that project, um, the seeds were planted in graduate school because I was interested in um, the role that balance between free and slave states played in the stability of the union. Um, so there was, um, there was some research that was being conducted at the time, which I found fascinating, um, that argued that the, 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 the union was sustainable as long as there was balance between free and slave states um, in terms of you know, the, the composition of the union. That's because every state, because of equal representation in the Constitution, has two senators. So as long as you have equal representation, um, uh, senators from either side could block what senators from, you know, whether they be free state senators or slave state senators, they could block, uh, they could block attempts to abolish slavery or free state senators could block attempts to expand slavery. Um, and so I found that, you know, that it was a, a really interesting argument, but a, a key question is, well, what about the filibuster, right? Did you really need balance if senators could filibuster legislation? And so this was, this, uh, you know, this was another puzzle that I thought was worth spending a lot of time on, and I um, did spend a lot of time on it. Um, and, you know, the basic answer to this question is that the filibuster really wasn't a thing prior to the Civil War. Um, especially compared to today, the, you know, you had flare-ups and use of legislative obstructionism, but um, but the fili the word filibuster really wasn't even introduced um, in the antebellum period. And so um, the key result of that research, or one of the key results, was that the Senate operated largely as a majoritarian institution throughout most of its history. Really, until you know, pretty recent history, the Senate departed from. Um, Actually, needing super majorities to to end debate and 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 move the legislation forward on almost all legislative items, civil rights being an important exception, um, you could pass things with with relatively narrow majorities, especially in the 19th century. And we're talking about extremely controversial legislation where sides are evenly divided and, and intense preferences exist on on in both the majority and the and the minority. Um, so, you know, that was a that was a key result. Basically, the Senate looks like a majoritarian institution. Um, but that leads to another puzzle, which is like, well, why? <laughs> if the if the Senate does not have some of these basic features or you know, basic rule that you think every legislature should have, how could they possibly have operated as a majoritarian institution? Um, and so um, this led to the development of a of a theory um, of institutions that basically, you know, the the basic argument is that um, it's true that the Senate did not have a cloture rule or a rule for the previous question um, throughout a good chunk of its history, but um, it, it, those who engaged in obstruction used to exploit the fact that the Senate did not have that rule were aware that it could be imposed on them. And so individual senators value the freedom and the power that the lack of these of a previous question motion granted them. And so while they would exploit it occasionally, they knew that there were limits to how much they could exploit it. And so the basic argument of how the Senate operated as a as a majoritarian institution was that a majority could always had the option to change the rules if, a, if the majority of the moment felt intensely enough about it. Um, and so even though senators could push the limits, um, you see this throughout the 19th century, they, they, they crack down, right? And so um, the, uh, you know, the eventual introduction of a cloture, uh, a provision for cloture in 1917 um, resulted from senators basically pushing things beyond what, what was tolerable. Um, and, and, you know, this, is, this project, even though it was historical in nature, when we were working on it, we were really in the thick of it, was uh, the early 2000s during the, uh, the administration of, of George W. Bush when filibusters of judicial nominations became, uh, you know, was cap were, were capturing headlines. And this is not, this is an innovation. This is, um, you know, the history of the filibuster is one of um, those who want to obstruct trying new things um, and seeing what the response is. 
And so um, there really hadn't been much in the way of judicial filibusters prior to the administration of George W. Bush. There had been maybe there were filibusters or maybe there, there might have been some filibusters around some Supreme Court nominations, but it doesn't look like the filibuster had actually killed or th- seriously threatened any nominations. Um, but the Democrats' use of the filibuster to block a handful of, of Bush nominees um, was really a, 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 an innovation. And so, you know, th- this really happened around 2003. So we're writing this book talking about how the way that, that the Senate kept obstructionists in check was through this threat of changing the rules. And so it's about this time that the term nuclear option is coined. Um, but what we had figured out probably about the same time was that um, there had been nuclear options deployed throughout the Senate's history in order to crack down on, on this kind of obstruction. And so they had fallen well short of, of, the, uh, of what happened eventually in, in 2013, where uh, the threshold for closure for judicial nominations below the Supreme Court at that time and executive branch nominees was reduced to a, a simple majority. Um, in, in 1975, actually, the, the Senate did go nuclear. They actually changed their, their precedents to lower the closure threshold for everything, um, including legislation, to a simple majority. They, and, and, and one, it's got to be one of the more awkward moments in Senate procedural history, for those of you who are into Senate procedural history, is that the Senate basically um, had a do-over. Right? They, they actually pulled the trigger, they pulled the nuclear trigger and then uh, a few days later, they explicitly undid the establishment of the precedent. Um, it's, you can go back and you can read the record, and this is, this is what they did. Um, we didn't really mean to do that. Uh, it wasn't like they just ignored that they did that. They actually went back and said, you know, we're, we, we're retracting this, right? And, um, um, and so uh, you know, th- this project has been the gift that keeps on giving because the, you know, the filibuster, by the time we started the project, Filibuster wasn't much in the headlines, right? Um, but since the, you know, we, 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 you know, we basically, that project uh, became more fully formed and was published and, you know, the filibuster has been constantly in the headlines. Um, and so it's always nice when you get that kind of validation that, that you, you, you are interested in something that is not only interesting and important to you. Um, it's something that really does have... A, in my view, major consequences for how American democracy um, and the U.S. Congress works. So let's come back to the filibuster um, a little bit later and, and, and go back to your, um, your concept of uh, legislative entrepreneurship. So I'm, I'm curious you know, about your work there. What, what really is the work that a legislative entrepreneur has to do to get their legislation passed, right? According to your work, is it you know, do they have to convince the the leadership? Do they have to convince the committees? Do they have to go do a handshake campaign with a bunch of their colleagues? You know, what are the the means by which? Because you know, I would think on the one side, getting your writing the bills is one kind of skill, and the other, it's a totally different skill to shepherd that thing, you know, through the end goal. So, can you talk a little bit more about that, and what did you find? Sure, that's absolutely the case. Like it's it's a it's a multi dimensional effort, right? So you. If your legislation is not solid in, in terms of, you know, in, in terms of the actual drafting of the legislation, right, there are terms that you have to use, right? You, you have to avoid technical mistakes in the legislation. And you have you have staff and there are lawyers, um, you know, professionals in Congress who can who can help with that. But you need to you need to make sure that those issues are, are, are addressed. Um, you need to be uh, a, a marketer. Right. You need to be able to say this is an important issue that 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 we should spend some of our scarce time on. You know, members of Congress are incredibly busy. Um, The they have a packed agenda. Why should they care about a a piece of legislation that's being introduced by a rank and file member of Congress? The leadership, you know, I would say the way that Congress operates today is is different from how it has operated throughout um, much of its history in the sense that now. Um, the most important legislation is, um, you know, it's, it's basically 
a, you know, a leadership effort um, where the legislation is drafted, you know, it's drafted behind closed doors. They decide what legislation the, the party's going to focus on, what, you know, how they, they draft behind closed doors. Uh, it doesn't follow the, the standard, um, you know, how a bill becomes a law story that, that I learned when I was growing up, right. The Saturday morning cartoon. Um, and so, um, but, you know, what I was inspired by were uh, individuals, uh, you know, I, I lead off the book with a story about, about Dick Armey, um, who was, you know, former majority leader, uh, representative from Texas. And uh, when Armey was in the minority, right? So he was, you know, he's in the minority at a time when it doesn't look like the Republicans are ever going to be in the majority, right? The Democrats had this, this stranglehold on the majority in the House of Representatives. And here's Dick Armey. Um, uh, newly, you know, new member of the, of the house, um, has no resources, right. Has no notoriety, has no, no, no power at all. You know, it's, it, he has an issue, which it, which is, um, he wants to address military bases, right. Now military bases, um, you know, closing of military bases, which is, you know, it, it's sort of like one of those third rails of politics, right? That it's it's fraught with all kinds of problems, right? Like if you say you want to close a military base, there are economic consequences. There are you can imagine opening yourself up to attacks about being soft on defense. Um, but so here's Dick Army, who um, puts together legislation um, that comes up with a procedure for closing military bases. And um, this is at a time, he does this at a time when, uh, you know, deficits are a major issue, right? People are really worried about spending, um, you know, defense spending is often sacrosanct, but here, here, here he comes, he's going to um, put together this legislation and uh, doesn't have a, ch- a snowball's chance of, of actually being enacted. Uh, well, you know, he is remarkably successful. He gets the legislation through the process, right? It, it gains uh, it gains traction, um, and eventually it passes. Um, and so, using that as a motivating example really demonstrates: like, here's somebody who comes from nothing, um, doesn't have resources, but yet this is an issue he cares a lot about. He sees a way to make progress on an issue that a lot of people believe there should be there should be change, uh, but it's hard to see how you get from point A to point B. He figures that out. Um, and so he does all the hard work, but, but from identifying the issue, um, drafting legislation, convincing um, others that this should be put on the agenda, um, and managed to shep- you know, shepherd it through the committee stages. Uh, this really was sort of like standard how a bill becomes a law process, where uh, shepherded through the through the subcommittee stage, the full committee stage gets it to the floor, you know, amendments to, to sink it are, are thwarted and it becomes law. Um, and so, um, you know, as, as you know, Dick Armey eventually, he rose from this lowly position as a minority backbencher to being one of the most powerful members of Congress. Um, and so it seemed to me like, you know, was, were there more stories like this? And it turns out there were, you know, Henry Waxman, a representative from California, you know, complete opposite of Dick Army in terms of their, their politics, their ideological positions. Uh, but he very much had, uh, had a similar story. He was a dynamo when it came to, um, to passing legislation, but he started out as, you know, also from uh, very humble beginnings um, and built a reputation for being able to handle that, uh, you know, all the different dimensions of, um, that, that are required in order to get legislation through the process. Eventually he rises to become a very powerful member of Congress um, and so the, you know, the, the, the project was, you know, you can, you find these case stories, um, which are very interesting and, and help to put, uh, you know, help, you know, it's a human interest a- aspect here that, that gets people excited about this. Um, but then the, the project really wanted to answer, is this more systematic, right? So if we, I can tell you stories, you know, all day about members of Congress who, they engage in this kind of legislative innovation and, you know, without, without the kind of resources you would think they would need in order to get things on the agenda, get them, get them through the process. Um, but they managed to do it. And why were they doing it and were they rewarded for it? And so when you look systematically, you know, collected data on every member of Congress, 
every piece of legislation that was introduced um, from the 93rd to 103rd Congress, I think was what the data span. And um, and lo and behold, yeah, there's a there's a story here to tell that this is there is this uh, there is uh, something systematic about how individuals who engage in this kind of behavior are rewarded. And, and I think you know Congress as an institution benefits from this kind of system because you get talented people, right? You get smart, talented, hardworking people into positions where they actually acquire the resources that enable Congress to be. Uh, more productive and a better functioning legislative institution. Do you think the the lessons you learned from that period are still applicable today? You know, when you have a weaker committee system and you don't have as much um, power to get legislation through without leaderships, you know, either or originating legislation or its blessing. Yeah, that's a really interesting question, and and maybe worthy of another book project. Um, given, yeah, I think that. That you know, if if this theory is correct, um, and this was you know this was the way that Congress works, it um, it doesn't it probably doesn't work the same way that it did in the period that that I examined. Given the centralization that has occurred, and I do think that centralization really has escalated, especially in recent Congresses. Um, there are so it uh, it limits the attractiveness of the kinds of uh, progressive ambition or, or the rewards for progressive ambition that exist in Congress. So I think, you know, committees are still important. Um, I think members of Congress still want to be chairs of committees. Um, but I do think that the, um, you know, the, the concentration of legislative initiative and, uh, and, and the legislative process generally within the leadership does limit the, the 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 rewards that are out there, the incentives that are out there for members of Congress to to engage in this kind of behavior. Now, it seems to me like if you rise to the party leadership, then you know that that the party leadership position has become much more of an incentive, right? Because if you make it to those upper echelons, you you are much more powerful and have uh, you know the ability to influence the course of legislation. Um, just it's exponentially greater. Um, but there are a few of those positions, and uh, it may create you know, that concentration. Uh, or, you know, if the theory is correct, I would I would hypothesize it it uh, it it has reduced the incentives to engage in this kind of behavior, which would hurt Congress as an institution. And most people, you know, that I've talked to, seem to indicate that it's mainly fundraising abilities that get you higher positions, whether it's in leadership or even committee posts. So that would imply a more, I don't know if that's called a showboat, but uh, it certainly doesn't imply, you know, a legislative, uh, you know, expert. Yeah, that's also a recent innovation. Um, you know, one of the things that uh, that I thought, it did, I didn't look at this in the project because it was, it didn't seem like it was that relevant at the time, but now I think it's highly relevant. The idea of leadership packs, where, you know, leadership packs at the time I was doing that research were, as the name implies, really just for individuals in the top leadership. Uh, the idea that you would raise money and then donate it to other members of Congress. Um, and so the, um, but now, you know, th this behavior is much more widespread. In fact, you know, Republicans have made it part of the, of the way they run the institution, that you're, you have a quota of money that you need to raise and donate to fellow uh, fellow Republicans. Um, I don't know if Dem Democrats may have followed suit, but um, so maybe that aspect of it has has changed, which would further create a disincentive for members of Congress to engage in this uh, in this behavior. So beyond the this concept of sort of getting promoted, if you will, to a to a committee or to a leader position, what else might motivate, or did you find any other motivations for legislative entrepreneurship? You know. One thing I always thought is you get your name on the sort of the legislation, at least the shorthand version, right? The Hatch-Waxman Act or the, you know, the you know, finance dot, et cetera. You know, um, you know, is that a motivation to get your name out there or are there other? Why else would they go ahead with this? Or did you did you find that it was neutral? All the other motivations? Uh, yeah, no, I think that's, uh, you know, I think that is 
probably important. I mean, it's hard to measure that sort of thing, like the 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 uh, you know psychological benefits that members of Congress receive from. Um, you know, I think members of Congress probably have bigger egos than your average person. I, I think it's hard to get to Congress, do all the hard work that you need to get to Congress without having that kind of ego and self-confidence. Um, but, um, you, know, the, you know, one question that I didn't pursue is the, is the uh, progressive ambition outside of the institution, right? So the old saw is that members of the House want to become senators, senators want to be president, right? And so um, obviously putting your name on a major piece of legislation is, um, you know, is, helps with that kind of ambition. Um, there are, but you know, there are plenty of members of the house who are completely content to stay there. You know, like Dick Armey was never going to, uh, you know, I don't think he had any ambitions to run for Senate or run for president. Maybe, maybe he wanted to be president. Newt Gingrich certainly wanted to be president, but, uh, but Newt Gingrich was not, you know, I don't think Newt Gingrich is as successful as he was, um, without individuals like Dick Armey who knew how to, you know, who knew how to do things behind the scenes and get legislation um, through the process. So, you know, th that obviously, I think that sort of external progressive ambition is important. Um, and, and there, you know, I think members of Congress, for the most part, you know, you, you want to get things done, right? And the question is, you know, I think my project was more focused on um, what helps to explain variation in that. Because you can say, like, all the members of Congress have are ambitious, Right. And yeah, there's variation in their levels of ambition, but how do you measure that? that, that that's a hard thing to do. Um, so undoubtedly, there are other things that explain why members of Congress would engage in legislative entrepreneurship. But, um, but, you know, I think the you know, key takeaway from the book is that this was, this was a feature of Congress that had not really been observed before or figured or nobody had figured it out before, even though you could, you could sort of see it, you know, like for, there were, uh, you know, qu there are some quotes that I, that I ran across from influential members of Congress, like Sam Rayburn had a, there was a, it was a great quote from him about, about progressive ambition. And, um, um, and, but, you know, uh, I'm sure there are lots of other things that contribute. I didn't, I didn't, want to claim that I explained all the variation that we see in legislative entrepreneurship, but I thought this was, uh, this was an important, um, an important feature. And, uh, but also I think it, you know, the larger story about how we understand Congress and, you know, I, I, I believe that, um, for all its flaws that, um, you know, that Congress has developed in ways that are, that make it, uh, a stronger institution. It really is the only legislature in the world, the only national legislature in the world that really is, you know, maintains a status as an equal with the, the, the executive. Um, and so why is that? I mean, is it just because the framers designed a system that, that was going to, uh, you know, keep Congress at the center of things? Um, I, I don't believe that. I think that, that Congress has evolved in important ways um, to maintain its status in the separation of power system. And um, in my view, the, this, this sort of the way that members were rewarded for this kind of activity was one, one thing that helps us understand why Congress has, has maintained its status. I sometimes wonder about the incentives to, to get legislation through and whether you could create additional ones that might w make Congress work better or at least different. You know, so, you know, I, I think about the business world and I think, well, you know, you get a a piece of legislation through the process becomes law. You get, you get a hundred thousand dollar bonus, <laughs> right. Or you get a star, you know, on the top of, uh, on the Capitol building, you know, you, you get like a kind of a, 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 what they call it tombstones in the, uh, in the investment banking world, you know, you get to put that up on the wall uh, and maybe there's some prominent place for it. You know, I wondered if there are other incentives that could be created that would, that would, nudge some of those other members, you know, to more align their ambition with something other than the showboat? Yeah, I think so. Obviously, you know, financial compensation, <laughs> you know, the bonus, uh, you know, the salary bonus is not something that you can do uh, for members of Congress. But, you know, to come back to the, the issue of, of, uh, of, of campaign contributions, um, that could be one way that you, that you provide an incentive 
for this behavior, right? You uh, leadership controls um, or has access to campaign resources. I think one of the hardest things about the job of being a member of Congress is having to raise the immense amounts of funds that you need to in very small increments, right? So members of Congress know that it's a, it's a daily grind in terms of raising money. Um, and so there, uh, you know, the leadership could provide incentives through, um, you know, basically you, you know, you get a break from going through your Rolodex and often members of Congress still use Rolodexes anymore, but that was the, you know, that was the, uh, you know, the, the image there of members of Congress, you know, when, when Rolodexes were still a thing, they're just sort of going through that, you know, okay, you got to make this call. Okay. Got to make that call. Right. They're calling donors. Um, so if leaders could reward members by saying, you know what, you can, you can have a few days off from calling donors um, because there's going to be money campaign contributions are going to flow your way. I mean, they're limited in the amount that they can get, uh, you know, it, they, that a, a leader uh, themselves could donate to a member of Congress, but they certainly can bundle contributions. You know, they can certainly direct donors um, in the direction of a member of Congress whose behavior they will want to reward. Um, so I think, you know, campaign finance reform is, um, you know, that that's one area where there has been some entrepreneurship, right? With John McCain, um, Russ Feingold being the names that are most closely associated with campaign finance reform. But, you know, we've, we've seen how that legislation has been problematic and gutted by the courts. Um, but the but given the kind the kind of campaign finance system we have, which you know one of the results of the the of uh, judicial decisions that have limited the intent of McCain Feingold um, is you know that frees up maybe that frees up leaders to direct uh, cash flows toward toward members of Congress in terms of something that they really value, which is campaign contributions and gives them, you know, gives them a break from the daily grind of having to raise all this money in order to mount successful reelection campaigns. So maybe we go back to the the filibuster now um, and, and your work there and this concept of the supermajority uh, requirement in, currently in the Senate. So looking out uh, from a historical point of view, you say it was it used to be more majoritarian. Now it's supermajority based on you know the ubiquitous or the, the ever use of the uh, filibuster, right? Um, in your view, you know this concept of thresholds, you know, whether it's 60, whether it's 50 or whether it's 75 or whether it's, you know, in your mind, how does that change the institution? And what do you think would be the right way for the Senate to actually operate? Hmm. Um, very, very hard question to answer. Um, so, you know, I think the, you know, often the framers are invoked when we talk about the use of the filibuster and super majoritarian provisions in the in the Senate. So um, you know, it's clear that the the framers did not believe that the Senate should operate as a super majoritarian institution. Um, but they did have a concept of the Senate um, that is consistent with how the Senate has evolved into a super majoritarian institution. Right, the Senate was supposed to be different from the House. Um, it was a different system of representation um, in the original Constitution. Senators were indirectly elected, right? There's supposed to be a buffer. You know, the idea of the Senate is basically it's it's uh, it's uh, it, there it's insulated to a degree from the popular unpredictable uh, you know unpredictable whims of the electorate, right? That, that was something that that the framers were were incredibly concerned about, right? They didn't want they didn't want the mob to rule, right? Um, they thought it was important to balance democratic representation with some insulation to give uh, elected officials flexibility, breathing room, right? So they didn't feel like they had to follow every whim. And they knew the electorate would kind of go back and forth and want things that were probably not in their best interest in a given moment. And how do you prevent, how do you prevent that from um, becoming policy? I, I don't know that, um, Having a supermajority, uh, supermajoritarian Senate is the best thing for the republic. Um, given other conditions um, that that currently exist in the country, but um, 
in my view, it's, you know, it's not completely out of line. You know, if we're going to invoke the framers and invoke the, you know, the genius of their design of, of, Amer- of the American democratic institutions, um, the uh, having supermajority provisions in the Senate is is consistent, I think, with how they conceived of the Senate as a bulwark against, um, uh, you know, the whims of the of the electorate, um, and so um, the you know the tough thing this the framers wanted to make it very hard to pass legislation. They wanted there to be broad consensus in order for policy to change. Um, now the question is, how broad does consensus have to be? Um, you know, it's open to question whether the framers envisioned political parties being like they are today, um, that we would have only two political parties, that they would be highly polarized, that it would be difficult to find agreement on, on a number of important issues. The, 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 you know, the, this is one of, the, one of the key tensions in democracy is this, this kind of balance between wanting to allow for broad representation, but also wanting to put up some barriers to um, to a rapid, ill-conceived policy change. Um, and so, um, you know, that comes with, that comes with a cost, right? The, you know, the fact that uh, civil rights reform was delayed to the extent that it was, that, you know, I think that the, um, I, I don't think the filibuster is entirely to blame for the survival uh, of Jim Crow, um, you know, basically survive, you know, you know, hunt, um, well, you know, um, you know it, the the filibuster clearly prevented civil rights reform from happening until arguably later than than it, it should have happened. Um, but if you go back and look at some of the early attempts to um, to introduce civil rights reform to to um, curtail Jim Crow in the South, there there wasn't broad consensus in the country about doing that. Um, and that, you know, I think that's more of a reflection on the, on, on the electorate um, than it is on Senate institutions. Um, you know, the filibuster, by the time the filibuster really, it was clear that the filibuster was going to be a powerful weapon um, against civil rights reform. Um, you know, it didn't really last all that long before, um, you know, before there were broad majorities in the Senate um, in the Congress generally that decided, you know, we need to, we need meaningful civil rights reform. We need to end Jim Crow. Um, and, and they, and they did it. Um, but, um, but that's, you know, that's, that's the cost, right. And and it's, it's a severe cost, obviously. Um, and so the, you know, I just think that the, um, but it's, it's, it's just a fundamental tension in the way that the American democratic system and any democratic system is designed, right? This, um, you know, you may hate the filibuster one day because it prevents something that you think should become policy from being enacted into law, but you might like it the next day because something you didn't think should become law was blocked. Uh, and that's really, you know, that's, that's, that, that's another part of the story, the history of the filibuster is, you know, every member of Congress has been on both sides of the issue, right? And I imagine, you know, many people who pay attention to the filibuster have been on both sides of the issue at different at different points. What about the notion that the filibuster, you know, it was it was taken out at some point of its kind of serial nature, like on the floor and, and moved so that it you could be entertaining multiple filibusters at the same time in this parallel track system and you're not tying up the, you know, the the floor time. Um, what do you think about that change in, you know, do you think that was a good or bad thing? And then the secondly is what about the, and related to it is the cost of the filibuster, right? Right now there's no cost. Whereas in, at least in, in, uh, in the mythos, right, there's the, uh, there's the person standing and talking forever. Uh, and that's a cost to keep that going. And we've lost that kind of cost associated with the filibuster. Do, do you think those two things, you know, what, what are your perspective on those? So the you know, the idea of the silent, costless filibuster, um, you know, it, we have that because you know that's one thing that there is broad consensus on in the Senate is basically that you know senators don't want 
to either be forced to do that or be forced to be present in the institution to stop individuals from doing that, right? So, it, you know, my view is that given the extreme polarization that exists in the Senate right now, if you went back to the talking filibuster that forced senators to take and hold the floor for extended periods, it basically, I don't think outcomes would be that different. I think, you know, a unified minority could tie the Senate up in knots and it's more of a headache for the majority than it is for the minority, right? So this idea that somehow you're going to put the minority on the spot, um, you know, by bringing in the cots is the, you know, is the and, you know, members are going to, members of the Senate are going to sleep in the, in the cloakroom and in their offices and be ready to come at the floor at any given moment, right? It's just, it, that just seems to me to be untenable. Um, and so, um, you know, if, if the majority wanted to end the fili- wanted to end filibusters, wanted to end the silent filibuster, um, whatever form of filibuster, they could do it tomorrow, right? I firmly believe that you know the nuclear option for legislation is something that is you know they could execute. And one of the interesting things about the about what we observed with the use of it for judicial nominations was that. It actually was, didn't live up to its name, right? When we talk about the nuclear option, because you know part of the um, you know the meaning behind that term is that they uh, you know it would blow up the Senate, but it would it would lay waste to much of the Senate and the and the agenda of the Senate because the minority would completely object. They would they you know the minority still has you know even if you eliminate supermajority provisions. The minority still has an awful lot of ways that they can tie the Senate up, um, and so you know, if a minority, if a minority party um, was ready to um, lay waste to the Senate's agenda, I think they could do that very easily. I think they could completely hamstring the institution. So unless you're willing to crack down on all of those things, which give power to the minority. Which I think there's also broad consensus on that that senators want to preserve that whether they're in the majority or the minority of the day uh, because they know they're going to be in the minority uh, at some point, right? And so you know senators have they they have long term ambitions they want to stay in the Senate um, they're not going to move to the White House and and they want to preserve those prerogatives for themselves when they want to block something that um, that they don't agree with. Um, so this idea that you know that when judicial nominations um, were when they deployed the nuclear option for judicial nominations and reduced the closure threshold to a uh, a simple majority, you know not much happened. You know apart from the uh, you know, the Democrats being able to get through a lot of judicial nominations, right? And even when uh, Republicans tried to use some dilatory tactics on that, it kind of backfired on them. And the Senate was held in session for longer. And guess what they did with that extra time they had in session? They got through more of Obama's nominees. Um, so, you know, I think the majority, um, you know, does hold the cards here. Um, and the, you know, forcing the talking filibusters, I think, is a non-starter. I mean, I just don't think if the parties weren't so polarized, um, if we were talking about, you know, a single senator, Jimmy Stewart style, getting up and, and blocking the institution, then sure, let them, you know, let them have at it. And, and, and we have done that, right? I mean, um, you know, Al D'Amato did it in the, you know, in the 90s and Ted Cruz did it more recently. Rand Paul did it recently. Um, but, you know, for the most part, it's, you know, it's, it's just, it, they're just, you know, the, use the term, they're showboating, right? Um, <laughs> grandstanding. And so, um, you know, when you have a Senate that is, essentially evenly divided between Democrats and Republicans, which is what we've had for, you know, pretty much the past 20 years or so, 30 years, really. Um, you know, the a unified minority could just, yeah, let them, you know, they're, they're happy to talk, right? You know, because it, it, it uh, you know, it, it, it hurts everybody. Um, and so, the, you know, the, the, you know, the, the, you know, either the majority would just cave on it, right, which is not necessarily what you want to happen. Right, because they want to go off and do other things and raise money and meet with constituents and you know, but they, I just don't think they, uh, you know, I think the tolerance, you know, a lot of it, you know, uh, the argument that Eric and I put forward in the filibuster book is a lot of it boils down to intensity of preferences. 
And so a unified minority with intense preferences, you know, they, they, they would love a talking filibuster, right? Because it's going to do more harm to the majority than it is to the minority. Here, let's talk about, uh, just before we move on to our common questions, uh, the concept of methodology. Um, I know you've done some work on methodology as it relates to social sciences and, and political science. Can you talk just briefly about what that work is, what the problem you saw, and what did you try to solve it? I, you know, I was trained as a political methodologist, you know, somebody who uh, makes uh, quantitative analysis and quantitative methods a uh, central part of their of their research agenda. Uh, you know, I'm not, I have been way surpassed by others in the field, uh, you know, younger, smarter individuals who know a lot more about, about quantitative methods in social sciences than I do now. But I do believe it, you know, it has a, it, it has a primary place in the social sciences and using quantitative methods um, to answer questions seems to me like I, I, you know, I believe that other methods are important too, uh, but it seems to me that, um, that it's core to social sciences. Um, I am I, in about a month, uh, a book will come out from Princeton University Press that I've co-authored with Ira Ketz Nelson that, um, that essentially advocates for uh, innovation in the use of quantitative methods to study history. Um, so the, the idea is that, uh, you know, you have your qualitative historian types, right? People who believe you should be in the archives, narrative is their primary mode of, of, of research and writing. Um, and, um, you know, we moved away from that. So quantitative methods have been prioritized more and more, especially in the discipline of political science. Um, and in many ways, qualitative methods have been relegated to uh, secondary status um, or these lower status than they used to be in the discipline. And um, our argument is that, well, you know, qualitative, there's a reason qualitative research has value. And um, while um, there have been important books and important figures in the discipline who have argued that qualitative scholars should use more of a quantitative mindset when designing and, and, and executing their research, our argument is that our argument in the book is basically that quantitative researchers should actually pay more attention to what qualitative people are doing and try to incorporate what is of value in qualitative research into their quantitative methods. So, uh, you know, there's a mixed method approach has become popular in political science where basically like, well, you're going to do some case studies. So, so you're going to have your chapters in your book that are, or your dissertation that are on, that uh, use quantitative methods, but then you're also going to have your case study chapters where you use qualitative methods and process tracing and, and other things. Our argument is basically like, you know, these shouldn't be separate, right? There, there are ways because of computing technology and advances and quantitative modeling that enable us to incorporate um, issues that are important to historians, like periodicity, uh, complexity, context, um, incorporate those into your methods. So rather than just run like standard regression models, um, innovate, right? And, and, and uh, there are opportunities to do things differently um, that I think are much more illuminating, especially when, you, when you, you're trying to do history, which, you know, is, in, is much, you know, is incredible. There are all sorts of new complexities that it can introduce when you're, when you're taking an historical perspective to studying social science questions. So I know you applied some of this kind of methodology to Congress, right? You, you did, uh, you know, you looked at campaign contributions and how that may have impacted votes in the long run. Can you talk about that and how this, you know, this methodology uh, approach, you know, can imply or highlight potential causation? That, I think that's quite important to understand when it comes to these kinds of methods. Yeah. So, you know, uh, Causal causation, uh, causal theories are core to the social sciences, core to the political science. Um, but one of the things that has emerged uh, in the social sciences is much more sensitivity to to causal inference. So how do you know? How do we know that a relationship is actually causal? Um, and so there's been uh, you know uh, what's called the identification revolution or the credibility revolution, where formal frameworks for causal inference have been deployed 
more and and um, and develop more in the social sciences. And um, so the one of the things that has that in my view has come out of this is how hard it is to actually assess causal relationships, right? So uh, there are many who believe that um, experiments are the gold standard for determining causal inference. And so ran, you know, randomized controlled trials. Um, but my work is primarily with observational data, uh, especially when you're doing historical work, you know, you can't do experiments on, on how people behaved 100, 200 years ago, right? Um, so you you have observational data where you can't do the kinds of manipulation that that researchers can do when they have when they do lab experiments or field experiments. Uh, and so, you know, what way what ways can we uh, deploy quantitative methods with observational data to to have confidence that we actually have uh, determined uh, causal relationship. So one of the things um, that, that um, you know, there's a whole range of methods. Um, one area that people have focused on is using repeated observations over time. So the idea is that um, there are certain things that stay fixed over time and there are certain things that vary over time. And so if you can account for the things that stay fixed, you have better purchase on potential causal relationships between uh, things that vary over time. And so the work that you referenced on campaign finance was an attempt to um, use that kind of uh, methodological uh, approach to better assess the relationship between campaign finance, uh, campaign contributions, and roll call votes. So this is a longstanding question, right? Do campaign contributions uh, affect roll call votes of uh, members of Congress. And so, you know, it's a very relevant question for the health of a democracy. Like there's some corruption implied that if members of Congress are receiving donations, um, are those donations, are there, are their votes more influenced by those donations than they are by the preferences of their constituents who are not giving them donations? Um, and so one of the things that you observe about uh, about donors, especially political action committees, is that they donate to people who are likely to vote their interests anyway, right? So the NRA donates to Republicans who are likely to support their, their positions. Um, liberal interest groups, liberal PACs give money to liberal members of Congress who, you know, in the absence of those, of those donations, probably would have voted the way that the interest group wanted them to. Um, so this is a this is a tough causal question, right? So if you just run, you know, if you just look at the correlation between campaign contributions and roll call votes, you're going to see there's there's huge correlation, right? There's, um, but that doesn't mean that it's causal, right? Correlation is not causation. Um, and so how do you actually, you know, how do you actually get at this question, um, you know, the the causal relationship? And so what uh, the one of the things that I argued in the research on on uh, campaign contributions is that you really need to account for predispositions of members of Congress to vote one way or another, right? If you're pre predisposed to vote for uh, for gun control legislation, um, then you're going to get donations from PACs that want gun control legislation. If you're opposed, predisposed to vote against it, you're going to get donations from the NRA and other kinds of groups like the NRA. But uh, predispositions, you know, we can assume that they're relatively fixed. Uh, and so if they're fixed, at least in the short term, um, you can, if you observe members of Congress over multiple votes, you can basically say, well, there's this thing that I'm going to call predispositions that is fixed over time. And without actually observing it, because I observe outcomes and variation in other things over time, I can actually isolate that part and take it basically take it out of the equation right mm -hmm. um or you know and and so that gives you uh potentially cleaner estimates of a causal relationship uh, there are lots of other assumptions that would need to hold in order for that to be true um and this work was done long before the causal result uh, causal revolution or identification revolution took place in political science um but you know it was an attempt to try to get uh you know get at this question of uh, a cleaner um, more reliable estimate of a causal relationship. And what did you find? 
that basically there is no, <laughs> you know, if you just, you know, if you don't account for predispositions, you see that, you know, you see big correlations. It looks like campaign donations are just driving all of these, uh, you know, driving these roll call votes. Once you account for, for predispositions, the correlation basically goes away. Very interesting. Great. Well, I think it's time for us to move on to our common questions we ask all the guests so we can later compare the answers. You ready to move on? I'm ready. All right. First one here is uh, what do you think congressional representation should mean? Um, I think, you know, it should mean a balance between um, a member of Congress's belief about what the country should be doing, what Congress should be doing, um, as well as uh, balance between that and and constituent preferences. Um, I, I, I think constituent preferences are largely hardwired into members of Congress. And I think one of the uh, bum raps that members of Congress get is that they don't care about their constituents, that, they, that basically they go off to Washington and they do whatever they want. Um, I think that that is, uh, I think that's not the case. I think members of Congress that the electoral connection that the framers built into our, our system of democracy um, is uh, still holds. Um, obviously, members of Congress are buffeted by all kinds of influences, but I do think that the core constituency connection um, is still there, and that the and that, that, our, that our our system of representation actually works pretty well. And when you say constituents, do you mean primary voters? Do you mean the you know the majority of the voters? Do you mean everyone in the district? Do you mean future generations? How do you define that constituency that they're representing? Um, it includes all those people. I think you know, members of Congress do view their constituencies differently. Um, you know, they separate primary voters from other kinds of voters. Uh, but I, I, you know, I'm, I'm not convinced that that uh, as as many claim that that it, that the kind of polarization that we're seeing now is due primarily to members of Congress paying too much attention to primary voters. I'm just not sure the evidence is there. Got it. Um, next one is how would your ideal Congress allocate its time? You know, would you have them two weeks in, in, you know, in town and then one week out, you know, all year round, 24 hours a day, you know, and between legislation and oversight, how would you mix that up? Yeah. Over, you know, so over time I, I have become more sympathetic to arguments that members of Congress spend too much time away from Washington. Um, I think there are deeper roots to the, to polarization, which I view as the, the primary problem that this country faces right now. Um, you know, I do believe that they, that uh, I've come to believe that basically, uh, you know, members of Congress, everybody's in the Tuesday to Thursday club. They don't, you know, they don't spend much time with each other. They're all, they're more constituency focused than they pretty much ever been. Um, and I think, you know, maybe, heretical to say this, but I think members of Congress might be spending too much time with their constituents, um, that there's not, you know, there's not a balance, uh, sufficient balance between interacting with each other in ways that, that might help with, uh, the, the, the vitriol that we currently see in Congress, uh, help to tamp that, tamp that down. Um, so, you know, I think, uh, you know, I think it's important that members of Congress do spend time among their constituents. I think members of Congress should probably have more relief when it comes to the amount of time that they need to spend with donors. Um, I think we should reform campaign finance. Um, again, this might be, will undoubtedly be perceived as uh, heretical or crazy by some that already donors have way too much influence on, on politics. Um, but I do think the, you know, the, 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 the campaign finance law has not adapted with uh, with new realities and that members of Congress spend too much of their time raising, uh, raising money. And that's something that they should, they should get a break from. All right. Well, the next question is uh, how should debate deliberation or dialogue occur or be structured in Congress? You know, should it be on the floor? Should it be in committee? Should it be behind closed doors or out in the open with uh, transcripts? You know, what's your, what's your thought on that? I think all the, all those things are, are necessary. Um, you know, I think, uh, you know, there's, there, there are unintended consequences to any kind of reform, right? So the introduction of cameras into the, into the chambers, right? You know, there are many who believe that that has led to, uh, had, has had its downsides. You know, I think it's important, you know, I think, you know, transparency uh, as much as possible uh, for a well-functioning democracy. But I also recognize that 
that things, some things do need to happen behind closed doors. I think there should be transparency once whatever negotiations uh, happen behind closed doors in order to maybe get legislation through a difficult choke point in, in Congress. I think there needs to be transparency about what happened behind closed doors. Um, but you know, the, 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 our democracy was founded on deliberations behind closed doors, right? The framers at the constitutional convention, you know, they, they knew that if, if there was broad transparency and everybody knew what they were doing in that room, that they probably could not have accomplished what they accomplished. And so I do, I do believe that has its place, um, that there needs to be some confidentiality, some, um, some insulation, but at the same time, I think that there does need to be transparency after the fact um, about how things, you know, uh, how, what transpired there, why certain decisions were made. And I'm not sure that we have that to the degree that, uh, that I would like. And you think that should that happen in committee primarily? Is that your, where you think it should take place or like today, you know, a lot of people think that it happens in the leadership office as opposed to in a committee structure, which would be, you know, a, a, a shift in the power. Yeah, I think I, I think that they're uh, in my view, you know, and again, you know, it's, it's hard to say, like, you know, we have a, like a hard and fast measure of like how much is happening in leadership offices versus how much should happen in leadership offices. You know, my gut is that 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 there probably is too much centralization. And, I, and but the thing that I've come to appreciate over my many years as a political scientist is that things are the way they are for a reason. Um, and so. The, the 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 centralization that has happened with party leadership has happened for a reason, and I think if we want to change that, we need to look at the underlying causes. And um, you know, I think it probably has something to do with polarization. I think it has something to do with like you know hypersensitivity of certain constituencies. Um, and so, if you if you want to go back to a more traditional committee centered Congress, which I think is it is important, and I do I think there are a lot of strengths to the way that. Uh, that the committee system worked, um, you know, you can't just say, all right, leaders, you can no longer do what you've been doing. We're going to go back to this committee centered, uh, committee centered process without taking into consideration what conditions exist that led the parties, led members of Congress to want to conduct business that way. And so if you sort of rip things out of the hands of the central, uh, central leadership, and put them back into the into a decentralized committee system or even subcommittee system. What adverse consequences would you see from that? What uh, next question is? What fundamental institutional improvement should Congress make within a fifty year time frame? Oh boy. Uh, <laughs> um, so um, I think an important institutional improvement would be making it possible for Congress to be more effective as a legislative body and um, rest more power back from the executive branch and the bureaucracy. Um, my, uh, although, I, you know, uh, as I mentioned before, you know, Congress is, there's no legislature like Congress in the world. Um, but I do think that the balance of power has shifted in ways that um, that have made uh, the executive branch less accountable. Um, I think one of the things that we learned during the Trump administration is the limits to institutional constraints and you know how much we rely on norms and the difficulties that there are for punishing transgressions. Um, so I'd like to see ways that Congress could reassert itself against the executive branch. Um, I can't tell you how Congress should do that. Um, you know, the 70s, the 1970s were a period where Congress did reassert itself against the executive branch, you know, uh, concentration of, of executive power, starting, you know, with FDR all the way up through Nixon. Some of those reforms worked, but but not all. And they failed, you know, several important reforms failed in important ways, like the War Powers Act, um, for example. Um, so I think that, you know, what, what Congress should do, I don't know how they do this as an institutional improvement, is figure out a way to uh, claw back some of the power that, that they themselves have ceded to the executive branch. Again, you know, there are reasons they have done that. Um, and so, you know, I always have to worry about unintended consequences. 
Next question is what book or article most shaped your thinking with respect to congressional reform? I, I would have to say Kingdon's book on uh, which where, where he, uh, where he coined the term policy entrepreneurship. Um, I think that that book, it's a short book, um, but it's incredibly insightful about, about how Congress works as an institution and the idea of, you know, this sort of individual level focus of members of Congress and the role that they play um, in both uh, how they modify their institution as well as work within their institution to make sure that it, it remains an effective legislative branch. Great. Well, the last question is really about your own plans. You know, what, what do you have coming up in terms of books or research projects? And over the long run, what are your plans? So the, the, the book project that I mentioned, which is uh, now complete, uh, was completed in December, um, has consumed almost all my research time. Um, but I, I dabble in, in, uh, in judicial politics. Um, and so I've published a few papers on that. I have a project that, um, which I hope will be completed soon, um, on um, the role that that judges' characteristics play in case outcomes. Um, so the, this is uh, focused on the federal district courts. Um, I would like to expand that project. Um, so basically this project looks at the role these characteristics play in outcomes of employment discrimination cases. I'd like to expand that to sentencing. I think you know with the recent Supreme Court nomination, we see that uh, you know issues of judges' backgrounds and and characteristics are uh, of fundamental importance to American democracy. And I think we don't have a good grasp on, on, uh, on the way that, uh, on the role that the judges characteristics play in, in, um, in judicial outcomes. So I'd like to expand that project in a number of ways. Great. Well, Professor Waro, thank you so much for your time. It's been a pleasure and best of luck. Thanks, it's been great to talk to you today.